February 5th, 1969. Dear folks, well, here I am spending my 12-month vacation in beautiful Vietnam. We arrived at the Benoit Air Base late this afternoon following a 22-hour flight with stop-offs in Alaska and Japan. It was one degree in Anchorage when we ran into the terminal in the middle of the night. These jungle fatigues weren't made for that sort of weather. Next, we stopped at an air base in Japan, where it was about 37 degrees. When we came into Benoit, it was 86 degrees. One thing I can say about this place is that it sure is different from anything I've ever seen before. I feel like I'm in the twilight zone. The buildings are all wooden structures that seem hastily constructed, very close together. The people are even smaller than I expected. It's really difficult describing what it's like to be here. It all seems kind of unreal. February 7th, 1969. Dear folks, Well, I've been in Vietnam for three days and haven't seen any action yet. Today I shipped out from that replacement company in Long Bin, right near the Benoit Airport, to the 9th Infantry Division here in Dong Tam. I still don't think I'm too far from Saigon. The flight here took only a half hour. February 15th, 1969. Yesterday we finished our training at Reliable Academy, got our orders, and were shipped to our units. About four other guys and myself were sent to this unit. This will be our base camp, which we'll return to after each operation. They say each operation is only for a few days at a time. Right now, Company C of the 3rd 39th is in charge of defending Dongtam, which is considered a soft assignment. They say they have almost no contact with the Viet Cong, and the few casualties they do get are from booby traps. Right now, they're expecting a little more action because of the Tet Lunar New Year just coming up. You, of course, remember what happened last year at Tet. This is really a strange war. When you're not out in the jungle fighting, you can swim in a pool, watch TV or a movie, drink all the beer and coke you want, and you can even play the slot machine they have in the EM club. All of our U.S. currency, including coins, has been exchanged for special military payment certificates, all paper. February 23rd, 1969. When we're marching through populated areas, the children come up to us begging, asking for cigarettes, etc. But many of them seem to be happy and smiling, like normal Western children. By our standards, the people here live poorly, but observing them, I get the feeling many of them actually enjoy their way of life. Last night, our squad went out on what they call a night ambush. We got all our gear together, marched out of camp, through the village where all the people watched us go by. We set up in the middle of a rice paddy, perhaps a mile or so from camp. One man stood guard for an hour while the other eight slept, each taking turns. All night the sky was lit up with flares, as it is every night. We could hear the sound of gunfire a few hundred yards off. There was firing in front of us and in back of us. We kept on jumping over the dike. Every time, tracers came in our general direction. However, no bullets came really close. About 4 a.m., this helicopter fired its rocket directly above us, which gave us all quite a scare, then landed perhaps 400 yards from us. In a way, it was all quite exciting, but I am glad we didn't meet up with any VC. With all this activity going on, Dong Tam was mortared for the first time in several weeks. We thought it might be the beginning of another Tet Offensive, but it's been pretty quiet today. February 26, 1969. You may have read about or heard newspaper reports of an increase in enemy activity in the past few days. In this area, mostly what they've been doing is mortaring our bases. Dong Tam has been mortared for about four days now. All this occurs at night. The days are as quiet as can be. So far, all we've done is gone on a few night ambushes and guard the camp at night. 
I've heard a lot of the fireworks at night, but nothing has come close. Occasionally we have to go out for two or three days at a time, plodding through the paddies, but usually we just hang around camp during the day drinking Cokes. They truck out two hot meals a day from Dongtam to our camp, so we don't have to eat too much sea rations. One thing I'm not too crazy about is sleeping on the rice paddies at night. Not terribly comfortable. They say it's worse in the rainy season since you have to sleep in water. Enclosed are a couple of photos of myself taken with one of the guy's Polaroid camera. In the background you see the camp I was telling you about. In one picture I'm ready to go out and find Charlie and in the other I'm defending the camp single-handedly with machine gun as horseshoe game goes on in the background. February 27th, 1969. Yesterday, we were humping through mud over our ankles, rounding up civilians, mostly women and children, and an old man or two. They didn't seem too unhappy about it. Many of them laughed on the way. In the monsoons, the mud goes up to the armpits. March 5th, 1969. A few days ago, our platoon had an interesting assignment. We rode on these hovercrafts all over the Mekong Delta. They float on a cushion of air, so can easily go over rice paddies as well as rivers. We made brief contact with some VC in a rice paddy. The boats have these big machine guns, and they did most of the shooting. Then they sent us out after them. We got shot at, but I did not return the fire, since I couldn't tell where the shots were coming from. Later they told us they had killed five V.C. No one got hurt on our side. Although no one was hurt when we contacted the enemy, we did have a tragic accident on the way back. We had to ride out on the deck of these vehicles, and they sped along at 70 miles per hour or, or more. For some reason or other, the boat we were on suddenly bolted, perhaps turning abruptly to avoid a sandpan. I didn't know what was happening except that the front of the boat went up and myself and another guy were swept off the side of the boat. I didn't think any, anything of it. The current was pretty strong and I had difficulty swimming with two bandoliers of ammo around my waist, but had no difficulty staying afloat. I thought the other guy was all right, too. One of the guys from the boat, which was coming back after us, dove in after him, but the guy went under before he could reach him. He didn't come up again. It's unfortunate that a guy should be able to come through a firefight and then drown in a stupid accident like that. March 6th, 1969. We had a memorial service this morning for that guy I told you about, the one that drowned. Our squad formed the honor guard and fired the 21-gun salute. Actually, there were seven of us who fired three times. I was relieved when nobody seemed to know what procedure to follow. It seems they'd never done it before, and many of them have been here for five or six months. March 11, 1969. For the past few days, our squad has been on the bridge detail guarding a couple of the bridges around here. Actually, all we do is hang around the bridge listening to the radio and buying Cokes from little kids. As usual, we guard at night, each taking a turn being awake. March 12th, 